Michael the Brain Pierce and Ted the Sensation Carlin are like an undefeated IoT tag team. Whenever a measurement needs to be made and data needs to be collected, this duo has the right tools, and they're the odds-on favorite to continue their championship reign. Michael from Microchip and Ted from TDK and Vincent's have joined us today to share some tips with us about how you too can collect data at the edge and be an IoT champ in your own office. Welcome to TechChats, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. All righty. Now, this is the first episode in a three-part series on smart homes and buildings. So just to start off, I want to get your guys' perspective on the IoT, how it fits into society, and what it means for designers and developers. Okay, so IoT is the Internet of Things. Uh, which could be anything from a small temperature sensor on a wall to actually a big industrial machine these days. So it pretty much means connecting anything to the internet. Uh, The smart home and building, offices, factories, retail, human health and fitness, so your watch, uh, logistics, cities, and much more. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the important things about about IoT and the, and the value it brings is um, with with all these different markets and and applications, th- there's a purpose to connecting these devices, uh, whether it be collecting different data, doing some sort of measurement, providing some value to the end end users. And so, with different sensors, we do different measurements and collect different amount of data. Um, and with the products from Microchip, they, you, know, you need to process it at, at the edge, at the node there, and then bring that back into the, the internet. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's talk about the architecture of the IoT. Yep, so I, IoT um, uses a lot of existing Ethernet and internet infrastructure. It uses the you know, standard uh, Ethernet routers, Wi-Fi routers, as adapters from... Uh, Bluetooth to Wi-Fi to Ethernet, um, and it connects to the cloud. Now, there's different levels of security needed depending on where you are within your network, and there are a lot of different ways to to handle that, and we're actually going to show you some of that coming up. So you already touched on a few things that designers need to address in IoT devices, like security and connectivity, but what are some of the things a designer should look out for or think about when designing an edge device? Yeah, so there's, there's key things we're going, going to uh, talk about which for these edge requirements. Uh, so there's the sensor interface, uh, the, how you connect to the internet. Low power is essential, especially if you're battery powered. The physical size of it, how responsive it is, the security, uh, low cost, and definitely it has to be robust. Uh, so you really want your device to be able to handle a wide range of, of voltages, especially if you're battery powered. You need the, the IOPEN current ratings to, to work uh, within the range that you need. And also you need a, a high temperature range because you don't know if you're going to be indoors, outdoors. You don't know if you're going to be in a uh, environment like Alaska in the middle of winter or here in Arizona in the middle of summer. So. You need to make sure your devices can handle that. And for sensors, you want to make sure that they have ingress protection so dust and moisture and other annoying things don't actually get into the sensor and and damage it. Many of the sensors used in IoT products are generally there to measure and collect data on something in the environment. And so those sensors need access to that environment, which means the sensor is exposed to those environmental conditions. So you, in order to protect the sensor from that direct path to harsh environmental conditions, generally you need some sort of dust protection or some sort of liquid protection, whether it be from direct spray or water submersion or just dust accumulating over time. Now, obviously, power consumption is a key consideration, especially for a battery powered design. So what are some of the ways designers can reduce power consumption and extend battery life? Yeah, so power is definitely important for devices at the edge. Uh, Low power operating modes and microcontrollers such as idle, doze, and sleep uh, help you use a lot less power when you don't need to be running, Um, or maybe you have a peripheral running but don't need the CPU running. There's a mode that can allow you to do that as well. And it saves power by either running at lower clock speeds or turning the, the actual CPU off. 
And also with a, a lot of our peripherals, uh, we can actually enable or disable the peripherals. And by disabling the peripheral that you're not using, uh, actually saves power as well. Uh, a lot of our devices now have core independent peripherals. Uh, some of these are like logic type gates, um, which can actually run by themselves without the CPU running as well. Or you can use a low power, like a 32 kilohertz oscillator to, to drive any timing circuitry needed. And that again, saves power as well. And Ted, what about your sensors? Yeah, so, so commonly these sensors are used in these applications in an always-on state. They're, they're constantly collecting measurements and, and providing data to the processing elements. Uh, so these sensors, because they're always on, are going to be some of the largest power consumption devices over a period of time. Uh, so ultra-low power sensors is really important to, to extend the battery life. And if the sensor has functionality built into it, to say wake up the rest of the system based on a certain uh, detection type, you can further reduce the power of these IoT nodes. And on the topic of sensors, besides the low power aspect, what else should designers be aware of when selecting a sensor? Yeah, generally speaking, um, uh, sensors you know operate on you know the same buses that are used for lots of hardware design. So industry standard uh, sensor interfaces such as I2C and SPI are very common and important because then they can interface directly to those processors. Additionally, you know, these go into different type of product enclosures. So four factors could be important. You don't want to necessarily grow your product just to accommodate the sensors. So small compact sensors are important. Often these devices are becoming more and more aesthetic to the users, so they want the, the sensor element that has to face the environment to either not be seen or be completely in, concealed from the, the user. And But they still don't want to lose any performance. They still want that high sensitivity to environmental changes, and they want the response time to be uh, fast or low latency, almost real time. Yeah, the, the low latency is a, is a key, and um, if, if you've got a microcontroller that's sleeping, it does take time to wake up. Uh, with the some of our independent peripherals, they can actually run in the background. Uh, for example, the spy can actually potentially read data without the CPU enabled and then wake the CPU as soon as the data is there. So it actually uh, reduces the, the time to wake up and, and process the data after receiving uh, while still maintaining that low power as well. Now you touched on security earlier. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so certain communication protocols have uh, very specific requirements. Uh, for example, if you're working with uh, either Amazon Cloud Services or Google Cloud, they have very specific things that you have to do and follow. And we actually provide example libraries on how to do this. And we also have this little piece of hardware on this page called the ATECC608A. Um, which actually handles a lot of the, the security authentication needs for you. Michael, you mentioned core independent peripherals a couple of times. Can you explain what those are and how developers can benefit from them? So core ind independent peripherals are actually hardware within the microcontroller. Um, some of these peripherals are analog to digital converters, the standard sort of spy bus UARTs, but we also have a logic type gate that can link different things together. So me being from the 8-bit world, we don't have, you know, super speed, you know, hundreds of megahertz type processing. So we find unique ways of doing things. And we can actually build a lot of stuff and hardware within the microcontroller that will respond very quickly and doesn't need the CPU intervention. Why do we care about that? It actually reduces the amount of code the user needs to write. Um, you can use a, a low-power oscillator a lot of the time. Uh, which saves power, and the application can be very responsive to outside system changes uh, because the the hardware itself uh, it generates all the interrupts and it can actually do a lot of the processing. And uh, it's almost like multitasking, but by using our core independent peripherals to to actually do the tasking for us. With the the peripherals running. In the background, you, you have the option of, of you're sleeping the, the CPU core, or maybe you're doing some background 
crazy math for a filter or something, and it allows you to do both at the same time. And what does it take to get those set up and running? Yeah, so to make it easier for people, we, we actually have a graphical user interface that allows you to set these up. So we have, uh, for the AVR, we have the combination of Studio 7 and the Start. And for the Pic Micro and also the AVR as well, uh, the combination of the MPLAB X IDE, the MPLAB XC compiler, and the MPLAB code configurator. Um, these let you configure the peripherals graphically by sort of point and click. Uh, let you select the different inputs and different outputs for the, the logic cells and makes it actually very quick to get something together. It also generates a lot of the, the generic code that you, you'll need for the SPY, for the UART, for the I2C, and it just helps you to develop your software quicker. All right. Now, what about the hardware side of things? This is the, well, actually, there's an AVR IoT and a PIC IoT um, board, and a SAM one now. So the this board is pretty much the same, and it, it can have either AVR 16-bit PIC um, or a 32-bit PIC or a 32-bit SAM processor on it. Uh, it has the Wi-Fi module, which here we're using the, the Wink 1510. It has this, the secure chip, the ATECC608A, and it has existing running code already on it when you purchase it. You can select either, depending on your cloud service, you can actually select the different firmware to match your cloud service. We have options for, for AWS and, and Google Cloud, and they're always working on additional clouds later. So our, our IoT boards actually have the micro bus on it, uh, which allows you to test and, and verify many different sensors that are available. So using the AVR IoT or the PIC IoT board, uh, it's a 30 second experience out of the box. Um, I've seen someone take the board, follow the instructions, and within 30 seconds, they're actually online and connected to a cloud service. So it's, it's a very quick way to demonstrate to your employer that yes, you can connect to the, to the cloud. Oh, that's impressive. Okay, now, Ted, let's talk more about sensors. Can you talk about some of the things designers are looking for when it comes to sensors in these different connected devices? Yeah, so uh, for the smart home and building building market, you know, hardware design engineers in this market often have a set of requirements, and, and those set of requirements on those equipment then have to get translated into sensor needs. Often hardware designers, you know, say some of these target applications here in robotic vacuums, they, they have a requirement where they need to detect the type of floor, make sure there's there's not a cliff that the robot's going to run off of, and avoid other objects in the room. Smart speakers, you know, these are becoming pieces of furniture in homes, you know, so they want them to look aesthetically pleasing to people. So they want to make sure that the sensors are hidden, and, and but they still get all the functionality. So it creates a challenge for hardware designers. Robotics, these are now home robots available. They need to be able to detect uh, where objects are in the room in 2D and 3D space, and they need to do that very economically. Smart locks are becoming very common on almost every front door. These are very low power systems. They often run on batteries, and they only want to turn them on when somebody approaches it, not have a lot of false positives that run down that battery. And then safety, security, surveillance equipment. Again, very similar to smart locks in that these are sometimes battery powered, so the sensor requirements are going to be be always on, and they need to be low power because of that. They want to also reduce the number of sensors so they can, with a single sensor, detect very wide field of view and work in a variety of environmental and lighting conditions. So what are some of the considerations that go into selecting the right sensor? For a long time, uh, these hardware designers had a common, common set of sensors that they could pick from. PIR sensors have been used for a very long time. However, they, you know, they have a very large lens that then shows up on the product and uh, may not look very good to the, to the user. They have limitations in their, their lighting conditions. There is latency associated with them. And they also sometimes miss minor motion. Uh, radars become popular lately. Um, these can be you know, higher cost, larger size, um, very high power devices, so not good for battery powered. 
And then infrared has been used commonly for a very long time. And there's infrared proximity plus infrared time of flight sensors. Uh, generally, you know, these have limitations in power and field of view uh, and the lighting conditions they can work in. And cameras are being put everywhere. I mean, cameras can be used to almost do anything nowadays. But there are drawbacks. You know, the, it does take a lot of processing, which means it's going to consume power. You're going to need a large processor. Uh, and there's also privacy concerns with putting cameras anywhere. So, I mean, in all, there, there's still a large sensor portfolio to choose from, depending on what the hardware designer needs. But each sensor is going to have its limitations, and there's going to be trade-offs between those solutions. You guys have been doing some really neat things with ultrasound that addresses a lot of these different issues. Tell me about that. Yeah, so, I mean, ultrasound's you know, another, another sensor in the hardware designer's tool belt. Commonly, these were large, discrete transducers, and then you had other discrete components around it to excite the transducer and, and also uh, receive signals back. What TDK and Vincent's has done here is they've moved to a MEMS-based architecture, so we've completely integrated that transducer on the silicon along with an ASIC and co-package it into a very small form factor. And this gives us advantages in several areas to continue that trend of collecting data from the edge, but do it now without all the limitations of these other competing sensors. And we can do it as ultrasound has done it for many, for many years, but do it in a much smaller, lower power form factor. We can do it significantly lower power. We can do it over very wide field of view. You can customize that field of view that you're sensing over. And you can fit in very small product enclosures since our package is three and a half by three and a half millimeters. So with this breakthrough in, in using MEMS to, to build a ultrasonic sensor, now if we go back to a lot of these end products the, that, that find themselves at the end edge of the smart home and building IoT markets, you know, you see these common these common requirements in these equipment. They're they're always sensing, they're always gonna need low power. Ultrasound and the fact that we've integrated this solution using MEMS and a very power efficient ASIC gives us that capability. Because it's ultrasound and it's not IR and it doesn't uh, require light, it's acoustics, we work in any lighting condition now. Because it, it uses a, a horn to customize that field of view for the acoustic signal, we can, we can operate up to 180 degrees and you can customize that into asymmetrical designs so you can get different field of views in different dimensions. And ultrasound is very sensitive to movement, so we won't miss minor motion that you often see with PIR sensors. Uh, ultrasound is very fast. You're not going to get the latency that you'll see with other types of sensors. So it opens up a new sensor that can solve a lot of the challenges that have been in this market for a long time with other sensors in the in a designer's portfolio. Now, what about this bit at the bottom about your MEMS microphones? Yeah, so you know now now that they're collecting all sorts of data at the edge of the network, there um, other sensors come into play, and and because microphones have been put put into MEMS, they're also very small and low power. So they're finding their way in these same applications where now, instead of collecting other types of measurements for environmental information, they may want to pick up uh, sound as well from users. So you find this very common in home entertainment systems, security systems, robots, and even uh, telecoms and conferencing equipment. Hey, thank you both for sharing your time and knowledge about the IoT and data collection at the edge. If you'd like to learn more about microchips, MCUs, and IoT boards, or about TDK and Vincent's sensors, click the links in the description or visit mauser.com. Also, check out the other episodes in the three-part series on smart homes and buildings, and be sure to check back soon for the next episode of Tech Chats. Mm-hmm.